Good morning, Interweb. World Builders Log 6. After the marathon episode that was the last video, we're going to do a slightly shorter video today. We're going to build a moon. But first, as always, we got to do some follow up. Big news the apparent size and brightness tab has been completely reworked. The critical error is gone, plus, there's like a whole bunch of really cool new features. So go check it out. Links in the description. There's still a few weird edge case bugs in it, but for most applications, it's working 100% fine. Thank you, Daniel Bamberger, for putting this together. This is literally none of my work. It's all him. Off air, I made a change to our Habitable Worlds rotation period. In the last video, I set it at exactly 24 Earth hours so that time conversion wouldn't be an issue. But lots of people in comments were like, hey, totally get where you're coming from, but how about vary it just ever so slightly? Do you know what? I think you're right. So I changed it to 22.8 Earth hours, which is about 96% as long as a day is on Earth. So it's a little bit different, but not so different that it's going to cause any sort of issues. So thanks for feedback, folks. That was cool. And the final point of follow-up is just a clarification point on plant color. Now, I didn't mention this in the previous video, and it was remiss of me not to mention it. But just let me stress, plants can be basically any color you want them to be. The reason why green plants dominate on Earth is because, look, green plants just happen to win out. But if we were to re-roll life on Earth, there's a really strong possibility that some other pigment would become the dominant color. It's basically just look, so you can choose whichever color you want. That said, for me, I really don't like that because like all the options are no options, at least in my mind. So I like to limit myself. And in general, I limit myself to two strategies. So we got a star here and let's say its peak output is in the green wavelengths of light. The two strategies I like to limit myself to are have plants be the same color as the peak wavelengths of light or have them be the complement to that color. And a refresher on color theory, complementary colors are colors that are separated by 180 degrees on the color wheel. And the rationale here is that the green plants or the peak output color plants are saying like, oh, that's a lot of radiation coming in. Like, I know I want to feed off solar energy, but you know, that's a lot. Let me block that. I let me reflect those peak wavelengths back and let me just feed on everything else. It's kind of like the sunscreen strategy. Whereas in the other strategy, the rationale is that the plants go, hey, that's a lot of energy you're putting out there in the green. Let me soak that in and let me reflect back the other wavelengths of light. So in this strategy, there'll be an anti-green, i.e. the complement to green. And that's what Panoptus 5 is doing here. It's going with the peak output color, the sunscreen strategy, plus modifications for atmospheric pressure. So like our sun is a G2 star, I think somewhere between G0 and G2, I can never remember. But its peak output is in the green wavelengths of light. Ergo, green plants. But again, just to stress, you can make your plants whatever color you want. All right, and that, I think, is follow-up done. Let's go build a moon, shall we? So before we start banging a load of numbers into this moon spreadsheet, uh, we should ask ourselves a couple of questions. Firstly, do we need a moon? If so, what type of moon? And also, could we have multiple moons? Do we need a moon? Answer, yes. For one, moons are just great. They're just really cool. They help with timekeeping. They illuminate the night. But most importantly of all, they help stabilize a planet's axial tilt. So if a habitable world has a fairly massive major moon, its axial tilt won't vary a whole lot. But if the habitable world doesn't have a major moon, its axial tilt could vary wildly and over really short periods of time, geologically speaking, which is just not great for habitability. Now, I have read stuff on the internet that say that gas giants could perform a similar stabilizing role. I'm not sure as to the veracity of such claims, and also I suspect that there's a ton of variables involved there. So unless you really know what you're doing, your habitable world is going to need at least one major moon. One moon-like moon. So what are the types of moon we can go for? So broadly speaking, we can categorize moons into two categories. Major moons and minor moons. And the distinction here is that major moons are round, minor moons are not. So major moons have enough mass for their gravity to crush them into a round shape. They're quite massive bodies. Minor moons tend to be quite low mass and so they tend to be like irregular potato shaped kind of objects. Our moon is a major moon and the moons of Mars, for example, would be minor moons. 
And we can also categorize them by composition. You can have rocky moons and you can have icy moons. That's a gross oversimplification of things, but it just helps in this context. In general, rocky moons go in the inner system. So starward of the frost line and icy moons go beyond the frost line in the outer system. So given that habitable worlds tend to be in the inner system, your best bet is to go with rocky major moons. And finally, can a habitable world have multiple moons? Answer, yes. Is my habitable world going to have multiple moons? No, I'm really sorry to disappoint. There's three reasons why I don't want multiple moons. One, it's complicated. The more bodies you add, the more details you need to know, the more kind of interactions occur, it just all spirals. Two, this is a basic build, so I'm going to go with the basic option, a habitable world with one rocky major moon. And three, there's a general tendency that the closer you get to a star, the less moons planets tend to have. And the further out you get, the more moons planets tend to have. Like Mercury doesn't have any moons, Venus doesn't have any moons, Earth has one, Mars has two, Jupiter has just loads, Saturn has more. <laughs> than loads, uh, Neptune has, or Uranus has loads, Neptune has loads, and Pluto, Pluto has five, which is mad given how you know tiny it is. So therefore the most kind of believable scenario for a habitable world in the inner system, in the habitable zone, is for it to have one moon. So I'm gonna stick with that. Okay, so let's, let's do, I'm gonna do explain -y time first before we build, just because I think it's gonna work out handier. As always, there's a whole section up here where you fill in previously established data. Don't need to talk about that because we've already gone through it. In the major moon's physical characteristics section, it's basically like a reduced planet section from the previous spreadsheet. As always, mass, density, radius, and gravity are like the most important parameters to establish. There's not many constraints here with mass. You want the mass of your moon to be less than the mass of your planet because if it were somehow more massive than your planet, then your planet would be a moon of your moon. Kind of doesn't make sense. Density, again, we're going for a rocky moon, so we want to give it a density indicative of that. So again, somewhere between three and about the high seven grams per centimeter cubed, closer to the three range, I would say. The radius, that'll play a role in determining whether or not eclipses, total eclipses will occur on your planet. And gravity is gravity doesn't really apply to me here, but if you were working with like a moon base or, you know, you were doing an interstellar setting and launching rockets from the moon, this would matter. Same deal with escape velocity. And the albedo, the albedo actually doesn't do anything in this sheet, but you can stick it in here for the sake of posterity. Then we have the orbital characteristics. This is kind of the meat and potatoes of the sheet. You need to establish your moon, moon's semi-major axis, how far it orbits from the planet. It must orbit in the moon zone here which whose inner limit is determined by the Roche limit. So if the moon were to orbit closer than this distance, the planet would tear the moon apart. And the outer limit here is given by the edge of the planet's hill sphere. That's the region of space around the planet where anything inside that region orbits the planet. For major moons, you wanna be, like I said, beyond the inner limit, but within half of the outer limit. So this value divided by two, that's your range. Eccentricity is how eccentric the orbit is just like in the last video, the higher the eccentricity, the more the moon will change size throughout the course of its orbital period, throughout the course of the month. But moons, at least major moons, tend to have fairly low eccentricities. This is the periapsis, how close the moon gets to the planet. This is the apoapsis, how far away the moon gets to the planet. This is the orbital inclination of your moon with respect to the plane of the planet. So you take the center of the star and you take the center of the planet, you draw a line between those two, that is the amount of inclination with respect to that plane. The orbital direction here would need to be prograde. Major moons will almost certainly orbit in the same direction as the planet spins, so the orbital inclination has to be between zero and less than 90 degrees. The orbital period is how long it takes the moon to orbit your planet. Basically, how long a month is on your world, assuming you're counting months based on the lunar cycle. And for major moons, if you're doing everything correctly, the spreadsheet should spit out a rotational period exactly equal to the orbital period. This implies that your major moon is tidally locked to your planet, which again, almost always will be the case. That is, just like our moon, your moon will present the same face to the planet, always. And finally, we have a tide calculator. So tides, 
tides are just like ridiculously complicated to compute like stupid complicated and as such this tide calculator here is extremely simplistic and it's only meant to give you like a super vague approximation of what's going on and the d the idea here that these ranges in meters are a kind of rough attempt at establishing what the tidal range is only out in the deep open ocean what the tides would be like at the shores of your continents will vary wildly depending on local geography so for earth we're looking at spring tides i'll explain those in a second of about 0 0.78 meters again that's only out in the deep open ocean varies wildly at the shore and we're looking at neap tides of about 0 0.29 meters I like to just keep those numbers in mind so when I make my own moon I can roughly gauge the sort of tidal force that it is exerting relative to the moon. That's about all this is useful for because again tides are just they're just so complicated it's not even funny. So what is a spring tide and what is a neap tide? So here we have a star, here we have a planet and here we have a moon. When the bodies are aligned like this all in a line, either like this or like this, you get spring tides. The gravitational pull of the combined sun and moon amplify the tidal range, creating the highest tides when they're in these permutations. Neap tides would be the weakest tides on your planet, where the tidal range is at its smallest. And this occurs when the sun, the planet and the moon form a 90 degree angle. So during, we'll say first quarter, or during third quarter. So we have spring tide, neap tide, spring tide, neap tide, back to spring tide. That's overly simplistic, but for our purposes, it'll do. And then the spreadsheet does some checks to see whether or not your planet is tidally locked, i.e. does it present the same face to either the moon or the sun, whichever makes more sense. And we check to see if the moon is tidally locked. And again, if you're doing everything correctly, your major moon should be tidally locked. So that's the moon spreadsheet. Fairly simple, not too much to compute. So I'm going to go ahead and put in the data from the previous video. There we go. That's the pertinent stellar parameters and the pertinent Hubble world parameters. Now I'm actually going to skip the physical characteristics for a second. I actually don't care that much about the physical characteristics. What I care a lot about is the orbital characteristics. Like I care about how long a month is going to be on this world. So as it currently stands at this semi-major axis at about just shy of 400,000 kilometers from our Hubble world, we'd have an orbital period of about 17 Earth days, which really isn't great. Because remember a year on this Hubble world is about twice that of Earth's. And we're looking at a shorter month here. So we're going to have like, what, like 40 months in the year. Actually, let me just go figure that out. Hold on one second. I'm going to fill in the calendar sheet for a sec. Right. Yeah. We'll be looking at about 42 months in the year. Uh, that is too much. That is way too much. So I'm going to need to move our moon outwards to increase its orbital period. Let's go to, um, let's go to, I don't know, 450,000. And I'm also, again, I'm just glancing here at the tide section to just see whether or not I'm somewhat similar to Earth. I don't really care too much if the tides are stronger or weaker. I just care that they're there and that they're of like a comparable magnitude. So anyway, that's 450,000 kilometers for the semi-major axis of our moon. That brings us up to 21 Earth days, 21.831. Let's have a look at that. We're getting it down. We're getting it down to 33 months in the year. We're always going to have just like a lot of months here. There's not really much we can do about it because our year is so long. But I just don't want to have to name like 50 odd months. Like that's crazy. 33 is still a bit much. Uh, let's let me just reduce the moon's orbital period or broader increase it and see can we get uh, a slightly lower number of months here. Okay, so if our moon's orbital period was about 23.9 Earth days, which would equate to 25.16 local days, remember the rotation period of our planet is now not exactly equal to Earth, we'd end up with about 30 months in the year. That's pretty cool. 
And assuming we have four weeks per month, we end up with a six day week plus some leftover. That's kind of fun. Um, I kind of enjoy that. Yeah, let's see if we can get that orbital period. So back to Moonsheet and we'll just fiddle with the semi-major axis until we get something decent. All right, 23.961, let's see, 0.961, yeah, we still get our 30 local months, cool. All right, okay, I think that's all right. So our tides now, remember, spring high tide and low tide was plus or minus about 0 0.78 uh, for Earth, so we have, the magnitude of our tides is less. And the neap types are about the same. So what I might do to compensate is I might actually pump up the mass of our moon. Because um, you know, the more mass of the object, the more it'll be able to raise tides. So if I go to like 1.1, what do we have here? See, we're increasing a little bit. I'm going to increase that. If I can get that, let's say, mid fives here, I'll be happy. Um, get a chonky moon. I think I'm in danger with this series of just making everything big, which I kind of want to avoid because like bigger is better is like a very common trope. But it's kind of like, you know, if you're going to have a high G world, it's, it's kind of what you need to do. And um, go a little bit, we'll go a little bit more. Sure. And let's put in just random decimal places to make it look all fancy. Uh, yeah. Ah, no, let's drop that a little bit. Yeah, that'll do. I'm happy that tidal range. It's weaker, so the tides on this planet would be weaker because our moon is further out, but we still have appreciable tides and that's gravy. I'm gonna hold the density, actually no, I'm gonna increase the density a little bit, just a little bit, there we go. So 1.25 moon masses is what our moon is, 3.5 grams per centimeter cubed. We have 1.06 times the radius of our moon, so it's basically our moon. And the gravity is 0.18 g, so 18% that of Earth. Cool, I'm fairly happy with that. Um, what else do we need to change here? The eccentricity, let's take the eccentricity and let's lower it. Let's lower it by a good bit, let's do something like that. So the moon will barely change size over the course of its month. And the inclination, again, this doesn't actually matter as long as it's between zero and 90 degrees. Again, I'll, I'll lower it somewhat. Um, we'll give it just a little bit. And just to be sure, our semi-major axis is definitely beyond our inner system. And it's within half of this value, comfortably within half of that value. So we are gravy there. So everything about this sheet is gravy. One last thing I want to do is I want to check what the total eclipse situation is on our path. So we need to pop over to the apparent size and brightness tab. I need to fill in some data. Probably in the next video, we'll, we'll go through this sheet properly. And we'll go through the calendar sheet properly in, in another video. But for now, I'm just going to do a little blitz thing just to see what's going on. Okay, so stars mass is inputted up here. Our home world, we want to give it a semi-major axis. Six, nine. I'll, again, I'll explain all this in its own dedicated video. But what we care about now is the apparent size. So the apparent size of our star is 0 0.663 times the sun. That is, our star appears to be about two thirds the size of the sun as viewed from Earth. That's important. Remember that figure. Let's scroll down to the moon section here and we'll fill in some data here. So our semi-major axis was 477,900 kilometers and the radius of our moon was 1.06 moon radii. So what do we got? Our apparent size is 0 0.85 times as big as our moon. Now the cool thing about our system is that the moon and the sun are basically the same size when viewed from the surface of Earth. So we can directly compare this number and this number. So our sun, 0 0.66 times the size of the sun. Our moon, 0 0.85 times the size of our moon. Which means that this moon is much, much bigger than the sun. Well, not much, much bigger. It's bigger than the sun. Therefore, total eclipses are possible, which is fine. It's a little bit sad. I was hoping I'd end up with a world where we didn't have total eclipses, but here we are. The numbers have led us this way. Sometimes you just got to follow it. Now the phase here, this is at zero degrees. This basically means full moon. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail in the next video. But at full moon, at a phase of zero, the brightness is 1.26 times as bright as our moon is on Earth. 
So we have, I'd say, significantly brighter nights on this planet. And in fact, we could actually make that, we could make that more pronounced. If I go up to the albedo here, if I just raise the albedo, i.e. the more reflective it is, the brighter the nights will be. So let me do something like, I don't know, well, actually, let me look at Mercury. Mercury is basically a glorified, like, asteroid moon thing anyways. Like, it's barely a planet. So what is it doing? Uh, Mercury, the planet. Cool. I mean, look at it. Look at it. Looks like a moon. Um, let me make this bigger for you guys. Oh, that's too big. There we go. Um, it's albedo. Where is its albedo? It's geometric albedo. That's important. It's 0.142. So the Earth, uh, not the Earth, the Moon is 0 0.113, Mercury was 0 0.42. So they're really close anyway. So let's let's cut the difference and let's say we'll make this Moon 0 0.124, something like that. So I'm envisaging, if you notice here, Mercury is, uh, if you compare Mercury with our Moon, you'll see that our Moon has a bunch of like dark craters and stuff, which I presume contribute to its decreased albedo. Whereas Mercury, at least in this image, appears to be not as heavily crater marked with dark patches. So, and its albedo is slightly higher. So what I'm envisaging here is a moon that isn't so pockmarked. It's basically in between Mercury and um, our moon. It's not as pockmarked as our moon, but it's not as bare as Mercury, which I think I can, I can easily justify. Our nights will be like, you know, crudely speaking, 38% brighter than nights on Earth. And I think that's really cool. I think that's really cool. Again, we'll talk about all of this in a, in another video in greater detail. But for now, I think that is that. Is that everything? Physical characteristics, we changed those. Orbital characteristics, we got our month down really well. We worked tides. We still don't have a tidal AI planet, which is exactly what we want. And we have a tidal like moon, which is also what we want. We worked on the number of months and that came to a satisfactory conclusion. And we figured out we have total eclipses and bright nights. Yeah, that's it. One moon done. I hope you enjoyed, folks. Thank you all so much for watching. A massive shout out again to Vanga Van Gogh, who's like the artist on this series. Links in the description. Go check him out. And again, massive shout out to Daniel Bamberger for uh, offering to help with the apparent size and brightness tabs. All of you are the best of people. Have a good one, folks. And until next time, Edgar out.